All right, we want to welcome all of you tonight to the uh, live stream broadcast here at Bible Baptist Church. We're here in our auditorium, and we're glad you're here to join us. It's a little strange still yet to be here without all of our people, but we are thankful for those of you that listen and then others that we may not even be aware of. We're glad you've found our website and you are watching tonight. We have something special for tonight. We hope you'll enjoy this. But just before we bring these folks forward, let me ask you if you would to continue to pray for our people, our church, and our nation. And uh, we've been told today that they're, we're hoping for some good news. I guess is the word we would say. We're hoping that we're going to see a turn at some point here. But we're trusting the Lord no matter what happens. And I want to ask you tonight to pray, if you would, for Brother Anderson. Continue to remember him in your prayers, if you would and ask the Lord to help him every day, and then to remember those that are shut in and uh, our seniors that uh, are especially sometimes alone during these times, so remember them if you would. But we have something very special tonight, and that is the Lacey family. They are here for us tonight and with us tonight, and Brother Tim Lacey, of course, as those of you that are in our church know that he's our music director, and then for those of you that are not a part of our church, that's what he does. And so tonight he'll be bringing a, a message that will have to do with uh, music, singing, uh, song. And his family is here to help him and sing for us. I think you'll enjoy the whole thing. I'm excited about it. Uh, he's done a number of these for us, but uh, this is the first one that I've been able to be here for to hear. So uh, we're, I'm excited about that myself. So uh, having said all that, Brother Tim, you come and uh, share with us what you all have planned, and uh, we appreciate you being here, okay? Well, thank you, Pastor. If you are like the rest of us, you are feeling all pent up and caged in your house there, feel like you can't get out, going stir crazy, and uh, that is to be understood. So maybe this sermon tonight will have a little something for you. Uh, before I get into the actual sermon, I wanted to introduce the hymn that we're going to used tonight as a, an example. Uh, shattered hopes, frustrations, cherished ambitions, gone up in smoke, all of this, and some folks have said that life could be beautiful. As Ina Dooley Ogden faced the future, much of what she had planned had been swept away by one happening. Her father had become an invalid, and she was the only one to take care of him. So instead of the thousands who she had planned would come to hear her speak, on the Chautauqua circuit, I'll explain what that is in a minute, she now had an audience of only one confined to a bedroom in her house. Yet, from this wits in corner experience would come a song that would bless many more than she could ever have touched in person and would encourage untold thousands to be a blessing to others. Now, let me explain to you what the Chautauqua circuit was. Has anyone ever heard of it? I can't hear you out there. Circuit Chautauqua, or Tent Chautauquas, were founded by Keith and Roy Ellison in 1904, so the early 1900s. Keep in mind, this hymn was written in 1912. The program would be presented in tents pitched on a well-drained field near town, kind of like tent revivals. Now, in this scheme, each performer or group appeared on a particular day of the program. First day talent would move on to other Chautauquas, followed by the second day performers, and so on throughout the touring season. Now, for Mrs. Ogden, the transition from utter despair to quiet acceptance, acceptance was something that took place rather quickly, for she had learned early that God's ways are not always our ways, but God's ways are always the best. So, she did not wait for a chance to do some great deed of greatness to shed her light abroad, but immediately began to do her deeds of kindness in the home and in her own neighborhood. Her household duties became a delight and a challenge as she took them as a calling from the Lord. She did it in such a way that her whole life became a homespun, lilting lyric, a foreshadowing of the song she would eventually write. So I'm going to ask Sandy at this time to come up. And we're going to play the chorus of this song, and let's see if you can guess what the name of the song is.
Thank you, honey. All right, can anybody guess the name of that song? I'm listening to you. It's bright in the corner where you are. All right, bright in the corner where you are. That's the name of tonight's sermon, bright in the corner where you are. Take your hymn, uh, not your hymn, but your Bible, that would be better, and turn to Matthew chapter 5, and let's read verses 14 through 16 to start with. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And those verses say, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being with us this evening and giving us the opportunity once again to preach from your word. I pray, Lord, that this sermon tonight will speak to the hearts of those that are trapped in their homes and feeling like they, uh, their light has been diminished and they don't have any opportunity to serve you, Lord, but help them to realize that they can serve you right where they are in their home and in their neighborhood, Lord, just as faithfully as if they were out amongst the public again. Be with us this evening. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. All right. Well... We're going to focus on verse 16. And verse 16 tells us the what, where, how, and why for performing good works. Just so happens that makes uh, for a good four-point sermon. And so let's start off with the what. Uh, let's start with verse 16 again. And let's read just the first part of verse 16. Let your light so shine. Now, at a church, little Jane had listened to a sermon on Let Your Light Shine. The only part she remembered was the text, but she didn't understand what it meant until her mother explained. It means being good, obedient, and cheerful. In the afternoon, there was trouble at the house, and Jane excused herself by being naughty by saying, I blowed myself out. She had lost her light. Well, what is this light that Jesus has commanded us to shine? Well, the light comes from us Christians, of course, those that believe in Christ. But we are not the source of the light. The source of the light is Jesus Christ himself. We are a reflection of that light that comes from Jesus. Now, the brightness of that reflection depends on how close we are to Jesus. The closer we are, the brighter our light. Now, unfortunately, if we are not close to Jesus, our light is dim, maybe not even visible. So for us to be a light for people to see, we have to be close to Jesus. Now, the next point is where. Where? Go back to verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. Your light is to shine before men. The story is told of a little girl who was shivering her way along a main street in one of our great cities. Seeing the beautiful lights of a church building and hearing the music coming from within, she went in and warmed herself as she listened. The preacher's text was, I am the light of the world. At the close of the service, she went to the minister and said, Did you say you are the light of the world, sir? The minister replied, Well, no, dear child, Christ is the light of the world. I am one of the lights. The little lass looked at him for a moment and then solemnly said, Well, sir, I wish you would come down and hang out in our alley because it's awful dark down there. So where are we to shine our light? Well, here's a tip. Do you need a flashlight when the sun is shining bright? Well, no, of course you don't. Do you need a flashlight when it is dark out? Well, of course you do. It only makes sense that our light shine for those that need the light. And that means we are to reflect Christ as brightly as we can to those that need it. Those that need to be saved. God has chosen us, his followers, to be a shining light for those that need him the most. If you look back to Matthew 5, if you start with verse 13, let me read those verses for you, starting with verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. And then verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. 
In those two verses, God tells us that we are the salt and we are the light. He's not asking us to be that. He's not challenging us to be that. He is telling us that we are that. As Christians, we are the salt and we are the light. Therefore, we have a job to do, and we either do it efficiently and do it to God's glory, or we don't. Now, the third point is how. How do we do this? Go back to verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. That they may see your good works. Now, we understand that good works are not before salvation. We don't do good works to earn our salvation. We do good works as a result of our salvation so that God may be glorified. Here's another illustration. One night a motorist was run down by a train at a grade crossing. That's very sad. The old signal man in charge of the crossing had to appear in court. After a severe cross-examination, he was still unshaken. He said he had waved his lantern frantically, but all to no avail. The following day, the superintendent of the line called him into his office. You did wonderfully well yesterday, Tom, he said. I was afraid at first that you might waver. No, sir, replied Tom. But I was afraid that old lawyer was going to ask me whether or not my lantern was lit. Well, we see the man here did plenty of good works, but he didn't have a lit lantern to do any good. So why did Jesus tell us to do good works? Is there a difference between works and good works? Well, I think there is, or he would not have said that. There must be. So just like the signal man in my illustration, he was working hard, but they were not good works. So what are the good works Jesus is referring to? Now, this description is taken from John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, and, the entire Bible, and it says, that they may see your good works, meaning their zeal and fervency, their plainness and openness, their sincerity, faithfulness, integrity, their courage and intrepidity, their diligence, industry, tireless preaching the gospel, their strict regard to truth, the honor of Christ, and the good of souls, as also their very great care and concern to recommend the doctrines of grace by their example in their lives and conversations. Now, what I see in this list of good works is that no special talent is required to perform any of them. Anyone and everyone should, could, and I pray that you will be able to perform these good works so that the unsaved world can see Jesus reflected in us. Now, the last point, point number four, is why. Why? Let's go back to verse 16 again. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, one more illustration. I was sitting in the gloaming. The gloaming is a Scottish term for twilight or dusk. I didn't know what that was, so I had to look it up. So he was sitting in the twilight or dusk, and a man passed the window. He was a lamplighter. He pushed his pole into the lamp and lighted it. Then he went to another and another. Now, I couldn't see him, but I knew where he was by the lights as they broke out down the street until he had left a beautiful avenue of light. Now, I couldn't see him, no, but his light could be seen, and that was the important thing. It was the lamplighter's business to light the lamps, not to make himself seen. It doesn't matter if people take little notice of you. The important thing is to make them take notice of your light. You do not need to seek to be seen of men, but you do need to shine that men may see. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works, not you. Now, why do we perform good works? For our own benefit? For the benefit of others? No, neither of those reasons are why we do good works. Jesus clearly commands that the goal of our lives should be to behave so that God gets the glory. We are to live so that men will see our lives and give our Father in heaven glory, not us. In order for God to get the glory from the way we live, we must be engaged in good deeds. It is not so much by avoiding gross sins. That's a good thing to do. We don't want to get involved in sinful activities that God's people uh, are involved in, but rather we get involved in the pursuit of good deeds, acts of generosity, works of kindness, ways of love. 
Now, since it is God's goal to be glorified in His people, and since Jesus says this happens when His people do good deeds, we would expect the Bible to tell us that God's goal in redeeming a people is that they might do good deeds. Well, how about that? The Bible does tell us that. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And he's talking about Jesus here, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Goes back to that salt and light again, zealous of good works. Christ died so that we might do good works and deeds and so bring glory to our Father in heaven. Now, I'm all out of points, all four of them. The what, the where, the how, and the why. Now let's go back to the hymn. Where Mrs. Ogden might have reached thousands by way of the Chautauqua circuit, by God's way she has literally reached millions. For through the years, more than 25 million copies of her song have been reproduced in books and on recordings. It is still heard on radio and television, even though it was written over 100 years ago. Well, we can see what Mrs. Ogden did with her opportunity to be a light where she was. She took full advantage of it and cheerfully reflected the light of her Savior where she was. Now, in this quarantine period that we're in, we are very confined. How about you? Are you biting in the corner where you are? Are you reflecting the light from Christ through your good works and deeds? Wherever you might be, I certainly hope so. But if not, we can all start right now, right where we are. This, I have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this short little sermon, but one full of, uh, full of impact for our lives, that we can, wherever we're at, whatever situation we find ourselves in, whatever you have put us in, you were in control. And even through these situations, Lord, we can serve you, and we can be a reflection of your light to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, to those that we do come in contact with, Lord, we can still be a reflection of your light. And um, we can do many things, Lord, that reflect your love for your fellow brethren and help us, Lord, to do exactly that. I ask these things now in your precious name. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask my family to come up at this time, and we're going to sing a couple of verses of this little hymn right in the corner where you are. Yeah. Sandy said you can sing along with us. That'd be good. Yeah. 
Well, I now understand what all I've been missing while I've been gone. And Brother Tim has been sharing these things about our special song. That was good tonight, wasn't it? That's great. We don't have a whole lot of amen here in the church since it's only the Lacey family, but that's good stuff, wasn't it, Brother Bill? All right. Then we've had texts from other folks that are tuning in tonight. We're so glad for that. But uh, it is true that we're under this quarantine, so-called. I got an interesting uh, prayer letter today from one of our missionaries, Seaside Mission, and uh, the gentleman who uh, wrote that, uh, he often debates people, and he'll go on college campuses where it's liberal and different things, so it takes a lot of courage. He asks for a lot of prayer, but he does very well. But he said this, I don't have all the list, but he said, uh, Joseph was quarantined to a pit. Daniel was quarantined with lions. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were quarantined to a furnace. And Paul was quarantined in prison. And we think about being quarantined, at least we're with people we love <laughs> and we're with our families. So thank God for that. But uh, the Lord's good. Sunday's going to be a great day. It's probably the most uh, unusual resurrection day that if the Lord tarries his coming that we will have experienced maybe in a lifetime. But to not have folks here on that special day seems odd. Uh, but we're looking forward to the service. We'll start right on time at 1045. We got a number of special music numbers, uh, one including the Lacey family Sunday morning, and uh, then some other folks helping us with music as well that morning, and then a message regarding the resurrection in that hour also. And then coming back that night, we'll have uh, our regular evening service at 630 with uh, our kids club and teen time with uh, Mr. Scott and uh, Mr. Randell. So we're excited about those things. Thank you for uh, coming on board tonight with the broadcast. And uh, Brother Tim, I appreciate that tonight. Bright in the corner. What a great challenge tonight. You know, it's uh, the little things that we can do. And uh, people often want, they come and ask me, what can I do in the will of God? They've asked my wife, what can we do? And it's as though they're asking, what big thing can we do? Something that make an impact. But you know, oftentimes it's the little things that become so impactful. And so great song tonight, great message tonight, and uh, to God be the glory for it all. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great evening, okay?